All right, let's, uh, let's pray. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your mind. God, I pray that you help us fulfill that last command to love you with all of our minds. You tell us in your word, think over what I say. God will give you understanding in everything. Our job is to think, and you give understanding. We need energy to think. We need pure hearts to think. We need protection from the enemy to think. Because we know that Satan makes war against the word of God preach. He causes cares and riches of the world to grow up and choke it out. He takes it away before it has any time to bear root or give understanding. And he also lets us persevere for a little while and then we fade away. Protect us from Satan and his work and power over the word and engage our hearts and minds to run hard after you in your word today, to sing to the glory of God, to pray to the glory of God, to speak to the glory of God, and to think to the glory of God. Help us think, O oh God. You make the simple wise. There's no one more simple than me. So make me wise. Make my words wise unto, unto salvation, God. And the only way you can do that is by making my words cease to be mine and making the very words I speak yours. So do it now. Don't leave me to myself. Don't leave them to themselves. But come and do a great work among us this morning. Make us desperate for you. Make us hunger and thirst for you. Give us, God, of your fullness today. And do remarkable works, works of which I cannot pray or cannot even think. Bind the broken, heal the sick, strengthen the weak, make steadfast the faltering. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. No New Testament writer is more concerned with the new birth than the Apostle John. We've seen so far by going through 1 John that that epistle is concerned with knowing whether or not we have been born again. That's what you get when you go to, the go-, go to the epistle of 1 John. When you go to the gospel of John, John is writing with a little bit of a different focus. Namely, he wants us to know what God has done for us in the person of Jesus Christ so that we can be born again. That's why when you open the gospel of John, it only takes him 12 verses before he introduces the new birth. Think about that. 12 verses into his gospel, and he's already talking about being born again. This is John 1, 12 and 13. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So, since we are walking through the epistle of 1 John, and we're about to get into the meat and potatoes of it. It seems right to me, after much prayer this week, to take the next three weeks to focus and meditate on and worship over the new birth. That's what I want to talk about. I want to talk about what it means to be born again. What happens when we're born again. What God has done for us so that we can be born again. And my prayer as I preach on this subject is that some of you would experience that new birth for the first time. Undoubtedly, whenever this, this message or this topic is preached, it is preached to people who think that they're born again. They've gone to church all their life, been carried to church by their parents all their life. They've grown up knowing godly things, very religious people. But at the end of the day, they love what the world loves. They say what the world says. They do what the world does. They chase what the world chases. And they're no different from the rest of the world. They think they're born again, but there's no life there. There's no change in affection. There's no change in vision. And I don't say this harshly. I say this, hopefully, and it will come across with great care. I don't want you to be fooled into thinking that you're something that you're not. I don't want you to be fooled into thinking that you have a great relationship with Jesus because you come to church on Sunday and you live like the rest of the world throughout the rest of the week. I don't want that to happen. So that's been my prayer, that... Some of you who think you're born again and aren't will experience it for the first time. And I enlist those of you who know you're born again to help me pray this week for these people. 
Help me pray for people that haven't been born again. And so just hang in over these next three weeks. It's important for you too because you're going to see how much grace has been given. If you've been born again, what you'll know when you come out of these sermons is that God's grace towards you was lavish and undeserved and not in vain. So what we're going to do is we're going to spend the next two weeks walking through John 3, 1 through 15. And then the last week, we're going to talk about how we're born through the word of God by the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ from 1 Peter chapter 1. So these are the three main points of the sermon today. So you've got a little sermon sheet in front of you, and this is going to be the answer to question number one. Here are the three main points. According to Jesus, the new birth is essential. According to Jesus, the new birth is essential. According to Jesus, number two, the new birth is the sovereign work of the Spirit. According to Jesus, the new birth is the sovereign work of the Spirit. And number three, according to Jesus, the new birth is made possible by His death and resurrection. According to Jesus... The new birth is made possible by His death and resurrection. And this is a point that we will see over and over and over again the next three weeks. We will not leave the third reality at all in this sermon series. So, why is the new birth essential according to Jesus? Well, according to Jesus, the new birth is essential for three reasons. Reason number one, you can be religious and not be born again. That's why it's important. You can be religious and not be born again. Look at John 3, 1 through 3. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, (laughs) we know that you're a teacher come from God because no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. I know where you come from, buddy. You're from God. What? That's high praise from, from Israel's religious authority. Nicodemus in verse 10 is called the teacher of Israel, not a teacher, the teacher. He's the Billy Graham of Israel. Okay? This is high praise levied on Jesus here. And he's very religious. And this is the way Jesus responds in verse 3. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, this should give us great pause here because Jesus cuts through all of these religious niceties like, I know where you come from. You're a miracle worker from God. What a compliment. He cuts through all of these niceties, goes right to Nicodemus' heart, and he says, you have a problem, Nicodemus. You're not born again. You are very religious, but you're not born again. There's no one more religious than Nicodemus in Israel. And there's no one more dead. The new birth is not religion. The new birth is regeneration. Being born again is not being able to recognize the supernatural in Jesus. Being born again is experiencing the supernatural in yourself. Being born again is not being a more religious version of the old you. It's being a new you altogether. Dead corpses don't need a church service. They need life. And you are no more alive because you're sitting in worship right now than a dead corpse would be if he were sitting in worship right beside you. You can set a dead corpse in the middle of a worship service. You can set a dead corpse in the middle of religion, but religion cannot give him life. You can be a teacher of religion. You can be a teacher of Jesus and not be born again. You can be a pastor of a mega church and not be born again. You can be a worship pastor that leads people singing in religious songs about Jesus and not be born again. You may come from a long line of believers. My granddaddy was a believer. My mommy's a believer, my daddy's a believer, and it doesn't mean anything for you. It means nothing for you. Life doesn't come from religion. It comes from a person. And if you don't believe me, listen to the way Jesus spoke to religious people. You search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. But you're not willing to come to me to have life. You love God's word more than you love God for your own selfish reasons. 
to debate it, to make yourself look good. You can love things of God and hate God. That's reason number one. Here's reason number two. By nature, we must be born again. It's essential because by nature, we're not God's children. Being born into this world does not qualify you for or make you nor anyone else a child of God. It doesn't. John 1, 12 through 13. I'm going to say that again. Being born into this world does not make you nor anyone else a child of God any more than being in worship service makes you a Christian. John 1, 12 and 13. But to all who did receive him, comma, who believed in his name. So Jesus says, okay, receiving receiving me and believing me, according to John, are the same thing. To all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. And these children, notice he says, were born. Children of God are born. But then before he tells you how they're born, he tells you three ways that they're not born. They're not born of blood which means not of a physical descent or genealogy. They're not born of the will of the flesh, which is somebody's sexual desire. They're not born of the will of man, namely man's initiative, like I'm going to decide to be born. That's not how they're born. They are born of God. The first birth, the first birth is not the qualification of being God's child because God doesn't have natural children. His children are supernatural because they're not born of blood, but of His genealogy. They're not born of the will of the flesh, but of His desire and will. They're not born of the initiative of man, but of His initiative. And this is the exact point Jesus makes to Nicodemus in verses 5 and 6 when He says, Truly, truly, I say to you, one is born, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he can't enter the kingdom of God. And here's why. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. Fleshly people, when they have sex and give rise to a fleshly person, just create flesh. That's all. Flesh gives rise to flesh, give rise to flesh, give rise to flesh. The spirit, that which is born of the spirit is spirit. So Jesus means when he says that which is born of the flesh is flesh, that your birth from your mommy doesn't make you a child of God. Because God didn't have natural children. They're all supernatural. We're not God's children naturally. We're God's children supernaturally, which is why Paul says flesh and blood cannot enter the kingdom of God. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 50. They can't. They can't because that's not the qualification. I've got a pulse. I've got a heartbeat. Can I enter your kingdom? No. Because that's not how you become mine. That's the point. That's why it's essential. If you're going to inherit the kingdom of God, you've got to be born supernaturally. Number three, the new birth is essential because without it, The wrath of God remains on us. By nature, God's wrath remains on us. It is no coincidence that a chapter which deals with a new birth ends with these words. John 3, 36. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, which is good news because it means if you believe right now, you have life right now. You're not waiting on God to give you something later in eternity, what you don't already possess. When he saves you, you have life now, now in the present. And when you walk through death, what you have after you come up through the other side of death is always what you've had. <laughs> life. We die and we're with the Lord. Life. That's what it means to have eternal life. But that's not the point. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. That's great news. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. And this phrase, God's wrath remains, is very important because it means that God's wrath is not only something that those apart from Christ will one day experience, it's something that those apart from Christ are experiencing already. Something cannot remain if it's not already there. That's why he says the wrath of God remains. It's there already. If it's not, it can't remain. This means that Christ not only died to save you from future wrath, but He died to save you from the wrath you were under right now apart from Him. And I know people will think, well, (laughs) 
good, gr good gracious, <laughs> present wrath. What are you talking about, man? We mean God, God, I'm under God's wrath. I mean, I've got a successful career. I got a spouse. I got healthy children. I got a little money in the bank. I mean, how can you say that I'm under the wrath of God apart from Christ when there's absolutely no evidence that I'm under God's wrath? I mean, good gracious, I don't even think about God half the time. Look at John 3, 19. And this is the judgment. Now that word's important because when God divvies out judgment, it's in the currency of wrath. The light has come into the world. This is the judgment. Are you ready? This is the content of the judgment. People love the darkness rather than the light. The fact that you don't think about Jesus is God's judgment against you. It's God's wrath against you. God's judgment upon you now is your love affair with the world. Your love affair with television. Your love affair with Facebook. Your love affair with sex. Your love affair with food. That is God's judgment on you. That's what the judgment is. You hate Light. You love the world because God's wrath remains on you. The wrath of God is made manifest in you and that you love looking at Facebook more than you love looking at Christ. The wrath of God is made manifest in you and that you get more joy out of watching Alabama or Auburn play football or shopping than you do reading the Word of God. The wrath of God is made manifest in in you in that you love being with your family more than being with Jesus. The current wrath of God rests upon unbelievers with the weight of 10,000 Mount Everests. And it not only keeps us from loving light in the present and plunging and plunges us deeper into our love affair with darkness, it is storing up for you future wrath on the day of wrath when God appears in holy fire taking vengeance on those who do not know God and vengeance on those who do not obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. And this is a big deal because if God's wrath is what keeps us from loving Jesus in the present and is what's plunging us deeper into our love affair with other things rather than Jesus in the present, we are confronted with this terrible reality. The reason that you do not know God in your sin is because God's wrath remains on you in your sin. That's why. Unless God's wrath is removed, you can't know Him. You can't love Him unless He takes the wrath away. Because his judgment against you will just push you farther into the vices that you hold dearly and you won't come to him. You need something apart from yourself to take you from the wrath of God so that you have a shot. That's the gospel. You're hopeless apart from Jesus. Because God's wrath plunges you farther into hopelessness. And you can't fight against God. You cannot know God in your sin because the wrath of God remains on you in your sin. That's why Nicodemus can't understand a thing that Jesus says. He's under the wrath of God. That's why Judas betrayed him. He's under the wrath of God. It's why the Jews arrested him. They're under the wrath of God. It's why every one of his disciples left him. It's why Peter denied him. It's why false witnesses lied about him. It's why Pilate wouldn't release him. It's why we all crucified him. But it's also why he allowed every one of those things to happen to him. If these things don't happen to me, if I don't take the wrath of God on my body for these people, they will be so far plunged into darkness that all they will know is wrath. So Jesus comes and he bears the wrath of God that keeps us in bondage to our sin and our love affairs with our paramours and misery so that we could finally see Him and savor Him and treasure Him and trust Him and love Him by being born again. That's why being born again is essential. And that's why Christ died to make it possible. Number two, the new birth is the sovereign work of the Spirit. Why do I say that? The new birth is not your work. It's not my work. And Jesus makes this very clear in John 3, 1 through 15. 
But before we look at what Jesus says about the new birth, I want to bring in three witnesses, okay, that walked with Jesus, that talked with Jesus, that listened to Jesus speak about the new birth. And I want you to notice how they talk about being born again. And they are James, Peter, and John. These are the three witnesses I'm calling. James, Peter, and John. This is James 1.18, the brother of Jesus, how he describes why you're born again. Of his own will, God brought us forth by the word of truth. You were brought forth, you were born of God because of God's own will, according to James. Here's what Peter says about it in 1 Peter 1 verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, are you ready for this? He has caused us to be born again. So Peter says, God causes you to be born again because of his great mercy. James says, of God's own will, he brought you forth by the word of truth. And this is what John says in John 1, 12 and 13. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. And then he says how they weren't born, who were born, not of blood, not the will of flesh, not the will of man. There's the three reasons or three ways they weren't born. Here's the reason or how they were born, but they were born of God. The new birth is the work of God. Anybody that stood around Jesus long enough to listen to him talk about it came to that conclusion. That is the teaching of your Lord on being born again, according to his disciples. Now, this is the teaching of your Lord about being born again, according to him. John 3, 5 through 6. We've already looked at this before, but we're going to look at it again. Truly, truly, I say to you, Nicodemus, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, we're going to talk about what that means next week. So if you're wondering what that means, just come back next week. We're going to talk about that next week. Unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he can't enter the kingdom of God. You've got to be born of the Spirit, by the Spirit. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Now look at John 6, 63. It's just a couple of chapters over, really easy to flip to. John 6, 63. This is what he says. It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The words I have spoken to you are spirit and life. So in three weeks, we're going to talk about how we're born again through the Word of God on the basis of Jesus' death and resurrection. And before we even get there, though, you see the emphasis Jesus places on the Spirit causing us to be born again and how we're born again through His Word. My Word is Spirit and my Word is life. This kind of gives you a taste of where we're going. So the new birth is a work of God. Jesus says it, James says it, Peter says it, John says it. But why do I say it's the sovereign work of God? Well, look at John 3, 4 through 8 a little closer. First, notice the assumption behind Nicodemus' question in verse 4. There's an assumption there. Are you ready for the question? Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? What's the assumption there? The assumption behind that question is human action. So what do I need to do to be born? Do I just, just crawl back up in there? I mean, what do you want me to do? Is that what I'm supposed to do? To be born again? That's the assumption. The assumption that Nicodemus has is that the new birth is somehow, some way, something that he is the initial actor and doer of. Okay? Jesus responds by addressing Nicodemus' question at both the explicit and implicit level. Explicitly, Nicodemus associates the new birth with a physical event. So it's something that happens like me being born from my mom, right? And Jesus answers in verses 5 and 6 by saying this, Truly, truly, I say to you, Unless one is born of the water and the Spirit, he can't enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, Nicodemus. If you were to crawl up in your mom's womb and be born again, the only thing that would come out of there is flesh. That's the point Jesus is making. What? That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. In other words, Nicodemus, the assumption behind your question is wrong because you're looking at the new birth in the wrong way. You think it's some kind of physical event, but it's really a spiritual one. You're thinking about it wrong. That's the first way Jesus answers the question. Here's the way he answers it at the implicit level, which infers what action must I do to cause this thing? Crawl? Walk? Jump? What? Is it like entering my mom's womb? He addresses this question by giving Nicodemus an analogy concerning the way that the wind works. 
And then he takes that analogy concerning the wind and he applies it to being born again. So this is what he says. Are you ready? Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. So Jesus, poor Jesus, the most misunderstood teacher in the history. No one understood what this man meant when he preached. Nobody. So this is, he's it's happening again. So let me see if I can help him. I'm going to give you an analogy, like the wind. And it works really well because in Greek, the word for wind and spirit is the same word. Pneumatos. It's the same word. And so he's just using interchangeably, okay? So the wind blows where it wishes. So the wind has a will, right? It does whatever it wants. And you hear it sound. So when the wind does what it wants, you know it's there because you can hear it. Or you can see it, the little leaves rustling or whatever. So we know the wind exists and it does what it wants to do. And we can't see it, but we know it's there. But even though we know it's there, there's an element of mystery to the wind. Namely, where it originates and where it goes. And we see this because of what he says next. But you do not know where it comes from. Origin. There's why I say origin. And you don't know where it goes. That's why I say destination. And so you've got this wind that does what it wants, when it wants, and you can see that it's working because you can perceive some of the effects, but you can't make it come from where it comes from to do what it wants, and you can't make it go where it goes to do what you want, okay? So Jesus takes this analogy and he says, so it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit, or in this manner, those born of the Spirit are. So what he's saying here is this. We can no more control or cause the new birth than we can control or cause the wind to blow. That is the summary of Jesus' teaching. Nicodemus, you can't cause this thing, man. You can't cause its origination. You can't cause its, de its, its destination. It does what it wants to do. You can no more cause the new birth than you can control or cause the wind to blow. And with that said, the enemy, enemy's probably got some of you thinking right now, well, I just don't have to do anything then. I don't know what do I have to do? That's not what I'm saying. There's a reason Jesus says you hear its sound. When the wind blows, something happens. That's why Jesus adds that you hear its sound to this analogy. Namely, when the wind blows on you, when the Spirit blows on you as a dead, unregenerate believer, you move toward Christ. You treasure Christ. You love Christ. You trust Christ. You worship Christ. When the Spirit blows, the new birth and faith is awakened simultaneously. Boom! I'm alive and I believe. And we're going to talk about that in three weeks. I'm alive and I believe. And when you're alive, that wind blows you to Jesus Christ. The wind of the Spirit blows, okay? And it makes the weather vane of your affections blow, move toward Jesus. It makes the weather vane of your affections believe in Jesus and trust in Jesus and love Jesus. When the wind blows, the weather vane of your affections move. But the weather vane does not cause the wind to blow. The wind causes the weather vane to move. And that's the point. If the wind doesn't blow, the weather vane of self that loves self, that loves all the things of this world, won't move towards Christ. Because the weather vane doesn't make the wind blow. Everyone knows that. Except those who aren't born again. What can I do to make it happen? I can just change what I like. So... That's what Jesus is teaching. And we know we're on the right track for two reasons. Here's the first reason. We know we're on the right track because it answers Nicodemus' original question in verse 4. Nicodemus assumes that the new birth is a natural event by natural means. And Jesus says, no, that's a wrong assumption. It's a supernatural event by supernatural means. And we know we're on the right track because of the way Nicodemus responds in verse 9. Think about this. Nicodemus has just been confronted with the reality that the most important thing in the world that can happen to him in order to see the kingdom of heaven is to be born again. Okay? And on top of that, he's been confronted with this reality. You can't make what you most need to come about. That is a terrifying place to be. You mean if I'm not born again, I can't go to heaven? And you mean that I can do nothing? I can't cause this new birth? Yeah, that's what it says. And that's why Nicodemus says, 
How can these things be? How can it be this way? This is the question of someone who's been confronted with the great need to be born again, to have eternal life, and stripped of any ability to bring about this life for themselves. And if Jesus would have answered, well, I mean, if you just read your Torah more, Nicodemus. Or just want you just tithe a little more, Nicodemus. Or want you just love more, Nicodemus. Be more pure, ceremonially pure. Take more baths. Do all kinds of stuff. Nicodemus would not have said, how can these things be? He would have said, okay, okay, what do I need, what do I need to do? Nicodemus would not have been so dumbfounded at this reality if God's, if God's solution to his great need were not grace but legalism, and neither would some of you. It's not lost on me that there are some of you right now that probably feel exactly like Nicodemus. And if Jesus would have answered your question of how you could be born again by saying, be baptized, or say a prayer, or take communion, or just, or just love more, if he would have answered your questions that way, you wouldn't be like Nicodemus saying, oh, how in the world can this be right? The reason that the doctrine of salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, on the basis of Christ's righteousness alone, is so unnerving is that it strips us of the handmade clothing of our forefather, Adam, and makes us stand naked before the one whom the whole world must give an account. And if God doesn't choose to clothe you, no one will. That's why people hate grace. We love legalism and hate grace because we trust ourselves more than we trust God. The reason so many people flock to churches that preach salvation plus salvation by Jesus plus works of righteousness is because Satan fools us into thinking that our legalistic works can be more trusted than God's grace. And so if we can be saved by grace and our work, we feel really comfortable because our fallen nature trusts our work more than it trusts God's grace. And God knows this, which is one of the reasons why in Genesis 3, 21, after Adam and Eve had made themselves shabby clothing, God strips them of their clothing, which was fashioned by their own hands and clothed them in garments made by his and in so doing says this, you cannot find freedom from shame and salvation from sin in the works of your own hands. Freedom from shame, salvation from sin comes from the works of my hands. And that's it. The only thing, the only thing on which you can rely for your salvation is God's undeserved, unmerited grace. This is the most foundational and important doctrine in the Bible because the entire Christian life, from your beginning in it to your end in it, involves you taking off the clothing of your self-righteousness every day, every day, every day, and going to God by grace and saying, my good works won't work. Work, clothe me in your grace. And if you don't think it's important, the day is coming. The day is coming when God will show you that the only reality on which you can depend is His grace. Whether or not you're born again or not. Because what do you do? What do you do when the fruits of your salvation that were so evident five minutes ago disappear in an instant and you fall headlong into sin. What do you do? What, what, what do you trust in for salvation when everything that you just did says that you're lost? Where do you go? Where do you go when things go wrong so quickly and you realize that even if you were to live a life full of meritorious good works minus the one slip up, that one slip up is enough to damn you to hell forever. In the presence of the Almighty God, where do you look? Where do you look for assurance when there's no fruit? Because there's going to come a time in your Christian life where you don't have any fruit. 
where do you look? Where do you look in moments of heart-wrenching sin? Sin that is like dormant for years and it just comes up. Where do you look? Where do you look? Where we look and trust in our moments of heart-wrenching sin is where we should look and trust in the moments of heart-warming obedience. Jesus Christ and His cross. There is no difference. When things are going well, you look at Christ and the cross. And when everything calls your faithlessness into question or your faithfulness into question, you look at the cross and say, when I am faithless, He is faithful. The doctrine of grace is the only doctrine that will keep you looking at Jesus from the moment you're born into Christ to the moment you die in Christ and are forever with Christ. The Christian life is a life of looking to Jesus. And it's not surprising then that Jesus concludes his dialogue concerning the sovereign work of the Spirit in the new birth with an Old Testament story that involves people looking at God's provision in order to experience God's salvation. Think about this. He has this long conversation with Nicodemus, and then Jesus starts talking crazy. As the serpent was lifted up in the wilderness, so too must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in Him shall have eternal life. Jesus knows his audience. He knows he's in Numbers 21, 8 and 9. Israel's rebelled against the Lord. God has sent snakes to bite them. The poison is in their veins. People are dying all around. Moses says, help. And God says, do this. Make a picture of the curse. Put it on a pole. And when people are bitten, have the poison in their veins, they can look at the pole and live. And so Jesus likewise comes into a world full of Nicodemuses. They have the need to be born again and the poison is in their veins. And the curse that has bitten them is sin. And Jesus says, I know how this story ends. My God will make him who knew no sin to be a sin for them. He will take me, a picture of his curse, and raise me up on a pole. And the people that have the poisons in their vein, if they look at me, they'll have more than life temporal. They will have life eternal. Nicodemus, look at me. That's the point. You want to be born again, Nicodemus? As the people of Israel, your forefathers, looked at the curse raised up in the wilderness, look at me. And when you go to the end of this gospel, guess where Nicodemus is? in front of the pole with a curse lifted up. That's where he is. That's where he is. And the concluding exhortation this morning is very simple. Look unto Jesus. Look unto Jesus. If you're a child of God, don't look at your own strength. Christ alone is strong. Don't look at your own wisdom. Christ alone is wise. Don't look at your own works of righteousness. Christ alone is righteous. Don't look at your own purity. Christ alone is pure. Don't look at your own faithfulness. Christ alone is faithful. Don't depend on what you feel or discern to determine what is truth. Christ alone is truth. Don't look at yourself. All you have is Christ. All you have is Christ. And if you're not a child of God, look at Jesus. The Spirit only blows when people are looking at the one who can save them. And that's why we're saved through the Word of God. God's Word exalts and lifts up the means by which we can be saved. And it also means... One of the few reasons that people are born again is because so few people are looking at Jesus. The Spirit's not going to move on you while you're looking at Facebook. Because if the Spirit awakens life in you when you're looking at something other than Jesus, that is your God. You have to look at Christ. And if God is so pleased, the Spirit moves. And while you're looking at Christ, the wind blows. And suddenly, you go from looking at Christ to moving to Christ in an instant can't be born again if all you look at is Facebook 
or Pinterest or Instagram or movie or porn or food or drink or your babies. It's not, you can't be born again. And so I beg you, I plead with you, I adjure you by the power of Jesus Christ and the faithfulness of his word. Come away. Just come away. Don't look at all the stuff. Don't look at all the things that look like they glitter, that can promise you life, and that can promise you joy, and that can promise you happiness. Come away and behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Just look at Him. Anybody can look. A baby can look. An ugly person can look. You don't have to be smart to look. You don't have to be educated to look. You don't have to be able to walk to look. You don't have to be able to talk to look. Anybody can look, 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 and be saved. Do not look to yourself. All you have is Christ. Let's pray. Oh, Spirit, I know prayers to you aren't normal. There's not much biblical precedence for them, but I'm going to pray to you. People are looking at Jesus right now. They're looking at Jesus. The curse. Him who knew no sin, who's made to be sin. And they need life. So come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain. Help them to see Christ high and lifted up and in turning away from everything else, beholding the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Help us not to look to ourselves. All we have is Christ. And we pray this prayer in His name. Amen.